Um, I'm going to talk today, but I'm not going to be able to talk for a long period of time. When I was in Iraq fighting, I got a little bit of a virus in my lungs, and so I'll talk as long as I can until I can't talk anymore. Amen. So, how many of you know what this is? Has anybody seen this? This symbol? This is, uh, this is called a, uh, a peace fish, or some people call it a Jesus fish. And here in America, you see that a lot on cars. You'll be driving along and you'll see that symbol in the back of the car. And that's supposed to represent that they are a Christian. So America, like most countries, if you went door to door and you knocked on the door and you said, are you a Christian? Most people are going to say, yes, I'm a Christian. But really, what kind of Christian are they? One day, my car broke down on the freeway. And I'm sitting on the side of the road and car after car went by me. No one stopped. And a lot of the people had this on the back of their car. So what kind of Christian really were they? Our word today is going to come from Revelations. In Revelations, Jesus is talking about different churches. There's seven churches that he talks about. He talks about the loveless church, the persecuted church, the compromising church, the corrupt church, the dead church, the faithful church, and last, the one that we're going to focus on today, the lukewarm church. So this is in the third chapter of Revelations, verses, starting with verse 14. And I'm going to read that now for you. It's titled, The Lukewarm Church. And to the angel of the church of the Lacedonians write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with the eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to his churches. This is the word of God. Amen. So, what is the lukewarm church? What is a lukewarm Christian? In the modern day church, there is a lack of faith. It is called a lukewarm church. To keep the church on fire, we must keep our fire burning individually. A hot fire of faith is made up with hot coals of God's word that catches fire quickly but burns slowly. So what they mean by that is picture charcoal or coal. If you just light one little piece, it might not catch on fire. It might not burn. You need lots of coal, lots of fire. You have to... You have to build your fire so that it's very strong. You can never build a fire with wet wood. It, it takes out the tongue filled with God's word. Christians that don't have a life committed to life in Christ cannot live by faith, and their faith wood is wet. If you don't commit your life to Christ, if you just go through life and you say, I'm a Christian, but I'm only a Christian on, on the holidays, or I'm not a Christian to my neighbor, you have wet wood inside. Your fire is small. It's not burning. Wood that hasn't gone through a time of waiting. So when you cut down a tree, you can't just burn that wood right away. You have to let that wood age and season, just like your Christian life. You have to study 
let it age and season. And then you can dry the wood. And that is the faith wood that you can set your fire upon. In 2 Corinthians 13.5, they say, examine yourself to see whether you are in faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. How do you know if you're a lukewarm Christian? Well, there's various ways you can tell. Do you spend time in worship, and does it feel like work? Do you go to church, you wake up, you're like, oh, I don't want to go to church. It feels like work to go there. Some of us feel like we shouldn't have to make time for God, but that we should just be so inspired by him that it naturally happens. But that's not how it is. You have to make time for the Lord. You have to open your Bible. You have to take time for prayer. You have to seek out God's word. But with anything truly important in our lives, it is when we make time for it that we develop the character from within. Another thing, service to others just doesn't seem appealing, especially in this time where we got this pandemic and, and people are suffering, old people can't get food or everything. Our passion for, filling, our passion for serving falls flat. Excuse me. It is a sign that we have been disconnected with the vine. John talks about this in 15, chapter 15, verse 5. Chapter 15, verse 5, John says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Amen. As we get more connected with the heart of God, which is made evident by the fruits of your spirit, we will find the energy to connect it with our families, communities, and churches again. This is very important. You need to want to be able to serve. Like the Good Samaritan, he served. Even though he wasn't part of that religious faith, he saw someone in need and he served. Another way that we become, that you know you're a lukewarm Christian, is you become satisfied without God. This might be the most important part. If we are satisfied without God, it is evident in our behavior. You become satisfied with material wealth. Oh, I have a beautiful house. I have nice clothes. I don't want for food. You start to forget who is providing this to you. Who ultimately is giving you the means to have these goods? It is God. Without God's faith, his, his faith towards you, your faith to him, his willingness to give to you, you would have nothing. We fill holes in our life with re, re, retail therapy. People in America, they love to shop. Instead of going to church, they'll be on their phone. Or maybe in church, they'll be on their phone and they'll shopping. They'll be shopping. We eat a lot. We drink. There's even lust that we have, that we fill our life with lust. Okay, we find our heart is more motivated by status and pride of building your own name than by coming under the leadership of the Lord. That's very important. So once again, we become satisfied without God. This is very bad. Without God, you have nothing. Every night before I lay down, no matter how tired I am, even if it's just a short prayer, I thank God for everything I have. I tell God, without, without him, I'm nothing. God gives you everything you have. You owe everything to the Lord. In Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23, he talks, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I'll say to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So you need to get with God. You need to know, you need to be with God and realize that without God, nothing, nothing can be done. Okay? Okay, here's eight signs that you are a lukewarm Christian. And we'll go through these. I have to drink a little water. Every now and then my, my throat starts to get dry. So the number one sign that you are lukewarm Christians Lukewarm Christians don't really want to be saved from their sin. They only want to be saved from the penalty 
of their sin. God is a useful fire escape they employ, not a God they worship. So a lot of people, they don't want to worship God. They think, oh, I'll use God at the end. He'll save me from my penalty of sin, but that's not how it works. You have to use God to save you from your sin. You have to pray to God, be with God, love God to be saved from your sin. Lukewarm Christians are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ, yet do not do radical things themselves. They call radical what Jesus expects of all of his followers. A lot of this you see in America, I, I, I see this a lot in America with these big mega churches. They do radical things. Oh, we've had, we had 25,000 people at our service last week or things like that, but they're not really doing anything that God wants them to do. They're not following a path to the Lord. Lukewarm Christians equate their, their, their sanitized life with holiness. So they think, oh, if I live, if I live sort of a, a sanitized, a clean way, I don't really need to pray to God or I don't need, I don't need God in my life because I'm living, I'm living a clean way. But Jesus didn't call us to be that. He called us to be in discipleship. If you're his follower, your life will not be defined only by avoiding sin, but also by entering into his suffering. You know, it says in the Bible, Jesus, he didn't, he didn't come for the, the believers. He came for the sinners. So you have to be able to, you have to be able to, to show your sin and everyone sins. You have to be able to show your sin to God and be truly sorry for your sin. And then God will take you in. Trying to live a clean life, but still sinning doesn't work. Lukewarm Christians really share their faith with their neighbors, their coworkers, or their friends. This is an important thing right here. A lot of people, like they'll have this fish symbol on their car, they'll be driving around, but they won't talk about God. They won't, they won't talk to their, their coworker. They won't say, you look like you're having a hard day. You know, let me share some scripture with you. They're afraid. They're afraid that people will talk about them. They're afraid that people will think they're crazy or, you know, they're, they're a Bible thumper, if that's such a bad thing, you know. Uh, Jesus said when he sent the disciples out, if you enter a city and they rebuke you, leave and shake the dust from your feet and never go back. Do not be afraid to, uh, to uh, prophesy the word of God or spread the word of God, especially with people that you love. You might have a relative who isn't a real true Christian, and they might be getting old or they might be sick. You want to talk to them. You want to be with them. You want to make sure that they know the true word of God before they die. You don't want your relatives, your loved ones to be left out when the time comes. You want to see them in heaven later. Lukewarm Christians think about life on earth much more than their life in heaven. This is very important. So every day people worry about my house, you know, I got to do this, I have to do that. But when was the last time they thought about their house in heaven? The house that the Lord is building for them in heaven. You know, the, the one sinner that was on the cross, he rebuked Jesus, but the other one said, you're a fool. And Jesus said, you'll be with me in my house, my mansion today. Are you building a mansion in heaven? You need to be able to think about that. Not only build your house here. Who, you know, you came into this world with nothing. You're going to leave with nothing. What you're going to have is what you build in heaven. That is the important thing. Okay. Lukewarm Christians love their luxuries and rarely give to the poor in a truly sexual, sacrificial way. This is, this is uh, easy to understand when you talk to, when you see in the news about billionaires. You'll see like Bill Gates, he's a billionaire. He's like the third richest man in the world. Bill Gates gave a hundred million dollars for something. Well, to a billionaire, a hundred million dollars is like me giving five dollars. It's nothing, you know. He loves his luxuries. People love their luxuries in life and they're not really helping the poor. 
You can give to the poor, you can offer them food. I rarely give money to the poor because I'm afraid that they might use it to buy drugs or alcohol, but I always carry food with me in my car. And if I see someone standing, you know, in America, we see a lot of people standing on corners with signs and say, please help me. I give them the food. I, I won't give them money, but I will give my money to people like Pastor Jeff or people that I know that are using their money for good. Okay, lukewarm Christians do not live by faith. Their lives are structured so that they never have to. So, Mr. David Platt, who wrote this, says, if you're not in a place where you feel desperate for the Spirit of God, then there is no way you are on the front lines of the mission. When we are on the front lines, we feel desperately for our need for God's help. Okay? You should always be asking for God's help. Please, Lord, help me get this done. Please, Lord, I need this to help. God will provide. Okay, the last thing is lukewarm Christians give God their leftovers, but not their first and their best. Okay? People talk about, oh, I got a busy schedule, or I got bills, or I forgot. Malachi, if we go to Malachi, the first chapter, verse 8, he talks about this. And he says, when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, it is, a, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. Malachi, Malachi first chapter, verse 8. Everything you have, God provides. So you're really just giving back to God what is God's. If you give to God what is God's, he will provide you more. So you should always give God the first fruits. Now, people talk about tithing, like 10% or whatever, and I understand that some people can't do that. That's fine. But you should always give to God as much as you can. You should praise the Lord and give to him. So here's some principles to remember about that. Don't blame God for your troubles. Troubles doesn't come from God, okay? God isn't up in heaven thinking, oh, Scott, I'm going to do this to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you to Iraq. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make you fight. Your troubles don't come from God. Trouble will defeat you. It will defeat, your, it will defeat you as a Christian because trouble will cause you to lack faith. Okay, look at Daniel. When Daniel was thrown into the lion den, did he lack faith? No. He had faith in the Lord. The Lord spared him from the jaws of the lions. Don't let your trouble defeat you. Men's traditions make the word of God less effective. You need to keep the faith of the Lord and become more effective than, than men's traditions. Okay? Amen. Let me get a drink again. My throat's starting to go. All right. Moving on. There's four keys to staying in fire for God. If you've ever gone camping, and this goes back to the beginning, one time I was camping in the mountains in August. And in America, in August, it's hot. But not where I was. I was in the mountains, and it started to snow. So I needed a fire. So if you ever go camping, you know how important fire is, especially at night. First of all, it keeps you warm. You cook your food. And if there's any wild animals, they'll usually stay away from, from fire. OK? If you're a camper in the middle of the woods, the last thing you want to happen in the evening is for your for fire to go out. So your fire is your faith in God. Like campers in the dark, you need light and warmth and the steady fire of God. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 through 7 says, For this reason, I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the layering of on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 
okay? It's for that same reason in the scripture, Paul speaks to Timothy with regards to guarding the deposit of the message of Christ. If we want to sustain the hope made available through Christ, we need to keep our fire burning within us. Amen. There are four ways to keep your fire burning so that you will not have darkness in your walk through our lifetime. Stick to the basics. No matter how much of a veteran you think you are, you know about faith. No one outgrows the basics of the word of God and prayer. Psalm 119 verse 105 tells us, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You need to keep the basics, okay? Follow the word of God. Through the seasons of life, communication with God is vital. Important to keep keeping the passion for him burning. The primary way we communicate with God is through prayer. And he is also primary speaks to us through his word. Prayer is very important. I have a long commute every day. I drive in my car for an hour each way to work. I spend a lot of that time talking to God. I pray, I say, Lord, help me today. Help me to get to work, help me to get home. Be with Sister Lillian, I left her at home. Please be with her, guard over her, okay? It's very important to pray. You know, God taught us how to pray. He told us to go to a quiet room and to pray. Pray as much as you can. Prayer is a two-way street. If you talk, God will listen. And he'll talk back to you. You just have to open your mind and hear. The second thing to do is to remain in fellowship. A burning coal, when removed from a pile of red-hot coals, loses its fire when it sits alone. Christians are experiencing the th same thing. That's why church communities and fellowships are vital to our everyday walk. When we stay with accountability, encouragement, and discipleship that come through fellowship, we remain on fire with God. This group is like a pile of coals. As long as you're together, you remain hot. If you leave... You, you know, as a group, if, if uh, let me see here, Sister Sufficient, if Sister Sufficient leaves, we need as a group to find her and say, no, come back to the group. Stay with us. Remain in your fellowship. That way there you grow hot with the word of God. Third thing is to remember the joy of your salvation. The day you were saved, what do you, how did you feel? Almost, you can't, e you, you can't even, uh, Tell other people how you felt the day you were saved, the day, the day that you accepted Christ. Okay, you remember that joy. So if you start to feel depressed or down and out, try to remember that joy you had when you were saved. Okay? What about David? When he felt, when, when his fire for God was dying, that led to his immortality with Bathsheba. And he cried out to God saying, cast me not away from your presence. The worst thing that can happen some people talk about hell being a fiery pit. It might be, it might not be. But the worst thing that can happen is at the end, you're cast away from the presence of the Lord. He turns his back to you. That is hell. Okay? You need to restore your faith in the Lord. Okay? I believe it's in Psalms 51, verse 11, where it says, Restore me the... Restore to me the joy of your salvation. That is very important. Okay? The joy that you got when you accepted Christ for the first time was not meant to be a one-time deal. It's meant to, you're, you're meant to go back to that every day. Or every time you feel like something is burning you. Go back and know God will never abandon you. Okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. You need to go back to your first love. Your first love is for, for God. And he says in Revelations 2, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Okay? Your first love is abandoned so many times. Our first love is and will always be Jesus. What keeps us focused on Christ is our first love. This is the great reminder that he who, who loved us first 
and our love for him now comes simply as a response to the greatness love we will ever know. The love that Jesus gives you is the greatest love, is greater than a love for your husband or your wife, is greater for love for your children, it is the greatest love you will ever know. Never forget that the Lord loves you. And he says in Matthew 5, verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others, so you may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. All right. There's a children's song. I'm going to end on this. I'm, I, I can't talk for very long because of my throat. But there's a children's song I'm going to play for you. I hope everyone can hear this. This is about your light. Okay? Your, the finger is your light. So I'm going to play this song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out, I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out, I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. So what that song tells us is you need to be a light for Christ. You need to keep your fire burning within you. You need to keep fellow Christians, your group around you. You need to talk to your family and friends. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You know, Lillian, in America, people, you don't see people preaching on the street. The people you see on the street are usually a little crazy. And Lillian comes to me and she goes, I want to go preach on the street. I was so afraid. I didn't know what the police would do, but God protected her. Okay, she lets her light shine. <clears throat> you got to be very important. It's very important. Let your light shine. Keep your fire burning. Stay in prayer. Read the Bible every day. Seek out fellow Christians. Also, give back to the Lord what the Lord gives you. Do not be afraid, because the Lord will always be with you. He is your light in the darkness. He will guide you. <clears throat> okay, my voice is, <laughs> you can hear my voice is at its end. So I think I'm going to stop on that. Uh, do you have anything you want to add, Lillian? Okay, I'm going to hand it over. I want to thank you for allowing me to be here today. I, I appreciate it. I hope that someday we can all be together as a group instead of doing this on chat, and then maybe my voice will be better. Thank you. And oh, I want, I want, to, end, I want to end with a prayer, okay? I always go to this. I always go to the 23rd Psalm. This is how I always end. I try to say this. This is how I always end. So I'm going to read it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. So I want to pass it over to uh, Chim Chimuvi? Chimuvi way? Mumwe? <laughs> I'm passing it over. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah.